Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna Maharaj, Dandors Pranam. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Yes, Hare Krishna Prabhu. Just one minute. Recording in progress. Recording stopped. Okay, Hare Krishna. Om Agyana Timarandasya Gyananjana Shalakaya Taksur Militanjena Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha Vanchakaupata Rubyascha Kripa Sindhu Bhayevata Patitanam Pavani Bhyo Vaishnavi Bhyo Namo Namaha Shri Vasati Gaur Bhaktavinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama Rama Rama, Rama Hare Hare All right so uh in the last class we we read Prabhupada's introductory lecture to the Vedas are there any questions on that? Anybody has any question? Anything at all? It's all clear to you? Okay, there's no questions. Hare Krishna, can you hear me okay? Yes, Guru Maharaj. Yes, Maharaj, we can hear clearly. Yes, Maharaj, can hear you. Yes, Guru Maharaj. Okay. Yes, so we're, reading, we're going on now to the invocation. Oh, yes? I know, because you're asking a question, uh, just a small question, Mara, because you mentioned yesterday uh, about the Bhagavad Gita, that for us, Bhagavad Gita is a uh, sruti, you mentioned, you say, uh, uh, and, but, but for the Indian people, it's not, it is like that. Bhagav what did you say? Bhagavad Gita is what? It's, it's not part of the Vedas. It's not part of the Vedas. For us, it's part of the Vedas, but not for the for, for the smarter Brahmanas. Well, no. Uh, for everyone, it's understood Bhagavad Gita is not Shruti. The four Vedas are the, the Shruti. The Bhagavad okay. Gita is the Smriti. Okay, okay, okay. The Bhagavad Gita is not Sruti. That's what I wanted to clarify. Okay, it's not Sruti, it's a Smriti. Okay, okay. Thank you. Right. And, and Srimad Bhagavatam is also not Sruti. Oh, Srimad even Bhagavatam, the commentary. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Srimad Bhagavatam is a Smriti. Okay, yeah. Maharaj. Okay, so the, Ve the Veda is a Veda. The Shruti are the four Vedas. And the four Vedas, the Upanishads are taken from the four Vedas. The Upanishads are there in the Vedas. So that's why Prabhupada gave us this Sri Ishopanishad. So that we have some uh, we have we have we can use also the Shruti in presenting our Krishna conscious philosophy. Yes, and sometimes I think Srila Prabhupada many times quoting the 
the uh, the Upanishads and other scriptures from the Vedas in his purpose. Yes, and he will mention since he will say the Vedic version or the Vedic statement is, and he, then you will refer to some Upanishad or something from the Vedas. Okay. So thank you, Maharaj. <laughs> So this is why this Asia Upanishad is very important because this is a, you know, for, I said for some, some people, they won't accept the Bhagavad Gita. They will only, when, if you have, to, if you're discussing philosophy with them, they will only accept the Vedic reference, which means the four Vedas. Srimad Bhagavatam, and if you quote no, Bhagavad Gita, they, they or don't quote, accept, they just accept the, the Upanishads particularly. You see people, Vedantists, the Vedantists, they are all speaking from the Upanishads. So, so it's an important point. I, I mentioned that there's that article in the Back to Godhead, which is there in your handbook the student handbook, the one article about the importance of the Ishopanishad and how Prabhupada wrote it for us. He gave the purports and everything. And so it's very, this this book, is, is Ishopanishad, is very important, very valuable for us because this is a Vedic, this is from the original Vedas, from the Yajur Veda, right? Okay, so we'll go ahead now on to the invocation. We can chant the mantra, please repeat. Om Purnam Madha Purnam Idam. Om Purnam Madha Purnam Idam. Purnat Purnam Udachate. Purnat Purnam Udachate. Purnasya Purnam Madhaya. Purnasya Purnam Madhaya. Purnameva Vashishyate So, this is a very famous verse. It's very famous, very well known, often quoted, often heard, recited, and so on by the Brahmanas. It's very well known. So, very, very important verse, very useful. So, we have the translation here. Prabhupada translates Om as the complete whole. And the, the key word in this verse, Purnam, perfectly complete. Ada, that, Purnam, perfectly complete. Idam, this, this phenomenal world. In other words, the world which we experience by our senses. Purnam, from the all-perfect, Purnam, complete units, Udachate, is produced, Purnashya, of the complete whole, Purnam, completely all, Aditya, Aditya, having been taken away, Purnam, the complete balance, and Eva, even, Avashishyate is remaining. So it's a very important verse, very significant uh, translation. The personality of Godhead is perfect and complete. And because he is completely perfect, all emanations from him, such as this phenomenal world, are perfectly equipped as complete wholes. Whatever is produced of the complete whole is also complete in itself. Because he is the complete whole, even though so many complete units emanate from him, he remains the complete balance. Right? So, sometimes you may hear uh, Srila Prabhupada explaining how one plus one is equal to one. And one minus one is also equal to one. 
And we call that spiritual arithmetic, right? In the material world, of course, that kind of arithmetic will get us in trouble, but this is how it's presented here today for us, that the personality of God, meaning Krishna, one, plus everything is still equal to Krishna. And Krishna minus everything is still equal to Krishna. So even though so many complete units emanate from him, he still remains complete. He remains Purnam. In the material world, we can never find that kind of situation where everything will be complete. Just like you may have the book and somebody may tear, tear a page out. Somehow maybe some child gets your book and rips out a page or maybe there's somehow there's a page missing. So the book is no longer complete. But here in this world, we can see that from Lord Krishna, so many units are emanating. So many universes are coming from him. And each of the universes are perfect and complete, right? They have, they have a sun to provide heat and light. And they have the moon, which is also important, which it said it gives the juice of life and the vegetables and it cools the planet. So everything is arranged within, the within the, each universe for the maintenance of all the living entities. Just like on our own Earth planet, everything is provided for the means, for the, for the maintenance, for the subsistence of all the living entities. The clouds carry the water and there's air and it's all arranged. There's perfect arrangement that everything is provided for the maintenance of the living entities. Of course, we're not maintained eternally, but at least for some time, we're maintained here in this material world. So this verse is describing how everything which comes from the Lord is perfect and complete. So the complete whole is complete, even though so many units are coming from him. But Lord Krishna is not reduced. He remains complete balance. All right. So we'll go through the purport and Prabhupada begins talking about how the absolute truth can be understood in different ways. It can be understood as the Brahman, the impersonal Brahman, or it can be understood as the Paramatma, or it can be understood as Bhagavan. So Srila Prabhupada points out that if you simply have understanding of the Brahman, that is not complete knowledge. The complete whole, Prabhupada said, is the complete personality of Godhead. So we want to understand the, com the Lord complete in all of his features. But if we only understand the, imp the Lord as the impersonal Brahman, that, that that is not complete. That is just one aspect of the Lord. His impersonal feature is just one aspect. And then other people, and generally the jnanis, they understand, they go, they approach the impersonal Brahman. And then yogis may meditate on the Paramatma. But if they just simply know the Lord as a Paramatma, as a super soul, then that is also incomplete. 
that only those who understand the Lord in the Bhagavan feature have the complete information about the Lord. One who knows the Lord as Bhagavan, then he also knows the Lord as Paramatma and as Brahman. Just like somebody has a hundred dollars, they also have fifty dollars, they also have twenty dollars. It's all included. And the same way everything is included in Bhagavan realization. One who knows the Lord as Bhagavan will also know his impersonal feature and his all-pervading feature as the Brahman and as Paramatma, respectively. So then Srila Prabhupada goes on to describe how knowledge of the Brahman, that is simply realization of the Sat feature. Sat meaning his aspect of eternity. So but the, we may know that the Lord is et eternal. And we'll think of the Lord in that way. Brahman is eternal. Realization of the Sat, meaning eternality. So the, 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 the Jnanis, they have that realization of the impersonal feature of the Lord, realization of his eternal nature. But the, the yogis, the paramatmas, those paramatma bodies, their realization is above that. They have realization of the sat and the chit features. They realize the Lord is eternal and they also have some knowledge they have some knowledge about the Lord, about the nature of the world and so on. So this is a higher realization than realization of the Brahman. But then if they go on still further, then they can realize the Lord's feature as Bhagavan. And the realization of the Bhagavan feature is the realization of the Lord as eternal, full of knowledge and full of bliss. We say Satchit Ananda and also Vigraha. So the nature of the Supreme Lord is like that. He is described in the scriptures as being eternal, full of bliss and knowledge and with a form. So then Srila Prabhupada goes into discussing about how the Lord has a form. Because Lord Chaitanya's movement is especially concerned in presenting the feature of the Lord as a person. And a person will have a form. Couldn't be a person without a form. And so if, if he were formless, Prabhupada writes, you can see there in the purport, if he were formless or if he were less than his creation in any way, he could not be complete. So we're discussing the Lord, the complete nature of the Lord. And Prabhupada, as we said, Om, the complete whole. The Lord is the complete whole. But if if the Lord does not have a form, and we have a form, then we have something which the Lord doesn't have. So how could that would that that would be a, a big contradiction in spiritual philosophy? If the living entities are something greater than the Lord, how could He be the Lord? So the Lord has everything, he, as Prabhupada said. He must contain everything uh, both within and beyond our experience. Otherwise, he cannot be complete. So usually when we talk about these different realizations, we, we can give different examples about uh, how we, we see things. For example, uh, one example Prabhupada gave was about the, the train. When the first train came to the 
village came was going to come through a village. It's going to be a train coming, very first train. So people in the village were all anxious to see the train. So some people came. They saw the and the, it, it it was in the evening. It was dark, and they saw simply the light on the front of the train. The train was away in the distance, and they simply saw the light on the front of the train, and they thought, "Oh." Oh, that's a train. And they went away home. They went home satisfied that I've seen the train. Other people, they waited for the train to come into the station. Oh, well, other people, they could see the, see the train in the distance. And they could see the train that the, the, there's an engine on the front and the carriages and so on. So they could see some details of the train. And they were satisfied. They went away home. But other people waited until the train came into the station. And then they saw, oh, there were people in the train and there was an engine driver and so on. They saw all the details of the train. So like that, uh, we're talking about the Supreme Lord, that there's different conceptions, different ways in which we understand the presence of the Lord. Some people know him as the Brahman, simply the all-pervading light or the impersonal aspect of the Supreme. Others know the Lord as Paramatma, the all-pervading super soul within everything. And others know him as Bhagavan, as the Supreme Personality of Godhead, who is full of all opulences. So like that, impersonal Brahman is realization of the Sat feature. And then Paramatma realization is realization of both the Sat and the Chit feature. And Bhagavan feature is realization of the Lord in full, Sat Chit Ananda. And also Vigraha. So like this, we understand the different features of the Lord. Then Prabhupada's purport goes on to talk about the, how the Lord has immense potencies, all of which are as complete as he is. So this world is complete. Uh, Prabhupada explains the 24 elements which this material universe is a temporary manifestation are arranged to produce everything necessary for the maintenance and subsistence of the universe. So everything is provided. All the food we need, the grains, they grow year after year. You can plant the seeds in the field every year and again and again, the, the crops will be produced. And in this way, by the arrangement of the Lord, we're able to maintain the, the lives here in this world. Probably we also can give the example about the young child. When the young child is born from the womb of the mother, how Immediately milk comes there in the breast of the mother and she can feed her milk to the child. So this is the arrangement of the Lord because a child is just born. So there's nothing really which he can eat. He has no teeth, cannot, cannot take anything which just born. The only thing he can take is the milk. So he takes the milk from his mother and it's arranged how the milk flows from the breast of the mother when the baby is born. Now previously, the, there's no milk flowing from the breast of the woman. But once a baby comes, then the milk flows out from her breast and she can feed the baby. The mother doesn't do anything. It's all arranged by the Supreme Lord. He's arranged all of these different things to facilitate our life. Just like 
the clouds carry the rain and the rain pours the water on the land. And in this way, the crops are able to grow. So the Lord arranges the, the, the water flows down the mountains into the sea. And the, from the sea, the clouds evaporate the water into the clouds, carry the water back onto the land. This is a complete arrangement within the universe to facilitate life for all living entities. But at the same time, we should understand that there's a, it's a temporary arrangement, a temporary manifestation, all right? We, we don't remain here forever. We go through the different phases of life because our bodies are material and material bodies, they, they grow and then they begin to decay and ultimately they die. But then you take birth again. So all of this is arranged by the Lord. He's arranging for everyone. All right. Reading some more from the purport here. All facilities are given to the small, complete units, namely the living beings, to enable them to realize the complete whole. All forms of incompleteness are experienced due to incomplete knowledge of the complete whole. I like this sentence. I think it's a very wonderful sentence. All forms of incompleteness. You know, certainly in the material world, we can feel incomplete. We can feel something is lacking. But Srila Prabhupada explains that feeling of incompleteness, that is simply our illusion due to incomplete knowledge of the complete whole. If we have full knowledge about the Lord and the creation, they will know that if, if we're complete. Everything is complete. So the human form of life is a complete manifestation. The, the complete manifestation of the consciousness of the living being. And it is obtained after evolving through 84 lakh species of life. In the human life, full consciousness is attained. The living entity does not realize his completeness in relation to the complete whole. He, go, he loses the chance to, to realize his completeness and is again put into the evolutionary cycle by the law of material nature. So Srila Prabhupada is describing to us the purpose of this human form of life, how we have to realize our relationship with the Supreme Lord. We have to use the human life for its proper purpose, which is to understand our spiritual nature and then to go on to realize our relationship with the Supreme. Behind this whole cosmic manifestation, there's a Supreme Being who is behind everything and we have a relationship with Him. So without doing that, then we are wasting the human life. If we don't use our life for inquiry into the absolute truth, to, if we don't use our human life to inquire about the Lord, then we're simply on the level of the animals. It means we're only engaging in this eating and sleeping and mating and defending. And we haven't even made an attempt to inquire about the nature of the absolute truth. So it's very important for us in the human form of life that we take advantage. If we don't use this human life properly, 
then we, we lose the human form of life and we go into the lower species and you go into the lower species and then you have to go through evolution again until you can come back again to the human form of life. So in this way, we can waste a lot of time in the material world. All right, Srila Prabhupada continues in the purport, because we do not know that there is a complete arrangement in nature for our maintenance. We make efforts to utilize the resources of nature to create a so-called complete life of sense enjoyment. So, <laughs> Srila Prabhupada is explaining now about our way of trying to trying to control the situation here in this material world. We try to use things like technology and scientific innovation to maintain our existence and to make our lives complete and, and comfortable. But actually everything is already provided by nature. Everything is there and the gifts of nature. But we are always trying to get more and trying to make make life be more comfortable, overcome more of the miseries and the problems in the material world. Well, it's not wrong, but at the same time, it's not the real goal of life. People want to enjoy the material world and they forget all about the real purpose of life. They become so comfortable enjoying the material world that they never think about anything more. They simply think about improving their comforts. So this is the problem. Srila Prabhupada explains, because the living entity cannot enjoy the life of the senses without being dovetailed with the complete whole, the mystery leading life of sense enjoyment is illusion. And then Prabhupada goes on to give the example about the, the hand, it's a part of the body. But when it's disconnected from the body, then it's no more useful. Well, I had this one friend working as a doctor in a hospital, and he told me how one day they had to amputate someone's leg his, the leg, the patient's leg had become all gangrene and they had, they had no alternative but to amputate the leg. And so he, he said, as soon as they cut the leg off, they, they, they just thought, get it out of here. Well, it was just so horrible. It was just so disgusting. So like that, the parts of the body, that when they're detached from the body, then they're useless. But when they're attached to the body, then they're very useful, they're very essential. And so the same way, we are also parts of the complete whole. We are the parts and parcels of the Lord. And we have a relationship with him. We're meant to be connected to him. And the purpose of Bhakti Yoga is to do that, to connect us with the Supreme. And when we're disconnected, then we're practically useless. We can do nothing properly. All right. So the, this way Prabhupada describes the illusion of the material world. That everyone's thinking how to enjoy the material world, to make a comfortable life here in this material world. But our real purpose is to be connected with the Lord. Whatever we have, we're meant to try to understand it's given to us by the grace of the Lord. It's for using in his service. So when we're disconnected from the Lord, that is illusion. And in illusion, we simply suffer. Nobody can be satisfied in the illusory condition of material life. 
So Prabhupada concludes this invocation mantra. We'll just read this final paragraph. The completeness of human life can be realized only when one engages in the service of the complete whole. All services in this world, whether social, political, communal, international, and even interplanetary, will remain incomplete until they are dovetailed with the complete whole. When everything is dovetailed with the complete whole, the attached parts and parcels also become complete in themselves. So we, be, we become complete when we are connected with the Supreme Lord. And when we are disconnected from the Lord, then we are incomplete. And that feeling of incompleteness, of course, that is illusion, but this illusion, this is our, our creation. We have created this illusion, thinking ourselves to be independent from the Lord. Actually, everything is connected to the Lord. So in this way, we understand this verse, right? We'll read the translation again. The personality of Godhead is perfect and complete. And because he is completely perfect, all emanations from him, such as this phenomenal world, are perfectly equipped as complete wholes. Whatever is produced of the complete whole is also complete in itself. Because he is the complete whole, even though so many complete units emanate from him, he remains the complete balance. So the Lord is always complete. And we, when we connect to the Lord, then we are also complete. All right. Are there any questions on this mantra, on this invocation mantra? Anyone? Guru Maharaj, I have a question. All forms of incompleteness are experienced due to incomplete knowledge of the complete whole. Uh, can you give an example for this? All forms of incompleteness are experienced due to incomplete... All, yeah, all yeah. Are due to incomplete knowledge of the complete whole. All yeah. well, feeling incomplete. We, you know, we feel like you know, I'm, I'm, I, I need this. I need, I need to have more money, or I need to have, you know, sometimes a husband and wife think we need to have a child. Uh, we need to have, you know, we need to have some kind of. We, we, we try to create a perfect situation for ourselves here in the material world. And we're thinking, if, if I don't have this, then my life is lacking something. Mm. We're feeling that kind of incompleteness, a lack of something. That maybe you're lacking, maybe your economic situation is not healthy. Or maybe, you know, a married couple, they want a child, they feel incomplete without having the child. Mm. Like that, so that income that fe that's a feeling of incompleteness, and that can be overcome by understanding the Lord and our relationship with Him by having complete knowledge of the Lord that everything is His arrangement. We have to understand how the material nature is working under His direction. And by his direction, somebody is rich and someone is poor. You could say it's also according to their karma from past life. It's arranged by the material nature. And you, like the couple who want a child, they also can understand it's the arrangement of God. The Lord arranges like this. 
he wants sometimes a person, a child to take birth. The Lord arranges for each and every one according to their past activities. So like that, that is incom yeah. incompleteness and how it's caused that how Jararani Ida Waibana Thank you. So in incompleteness. We feel incomplete. We lack something. We're lacking something. We think I need. What well, if I had that? Then I, my life will be complete. Then I'll feel complete. Yeah, you know, yeah. You you, yeah. you feel you want to do something. You want to achieve something. That feeling of achievement. Then you feel complete. Without these things, you're never complete. So that's the feeling. That, but it's all due to forgetfulness of the Lord. In, due to incomplete knowledge of the Lord, we're feeling incomplete. Something is lacking. Oh, why am I suffering? Other people have got so much wealth. I don't have wealth. Why Why they have got so much wealth and I don't have it? Someone else has got so many children and I can, we cannot even have one child. Why is it like this? We, you know, we yeah. feel incomplete. Something is that something something is lacking. But this, if we have complete knowledge of the Lord and understand how everything is going on under His direction, then we can be satisfied. Yes, Guru. So we. Yeah. And we see everything, how everything is provided for our maintenance, how it's all, it's, everything is complete. You know, we don't lack anything. The, uh, all the food and the, everything is provided for our maintenance, the water, the air, everything is arranged so nicely under the direction of the Supreme Lord. But we are thinking more about sense gratification we want to satisfy our senses and we, you know a lot of science and technology is aimed at making the world more comfortable and more pleasing to us more pleasurable to our senses that is our mistake we're thinking that we, we're just meant for enjoying here in this world but that is not our real position. We're not meant to just try to be enjoyers, but rather we're meant to be enjoyed. Our position is meant, we're meant to be engaged in the service of the Lord. But that realization has to be developed through association and through hearing from scriptures. Then people can understand these things. But Guru Maharaj, uh, if we get diseases, uh, then we need science and technology, right? We have to go to the doctor and the doctor performs a surgery or something like that. Yes, yes, we do. Yeah. Then, yeah, but in that case, we need uh, science, uh, like uh, some more arrangements, right, Guru Maharaj, for our maintenance. Yes, well, we're not saying they should not take care of our health. We, Of course, you have to take care of your health and sometimes you have to go to the doctors and have to go to hospitals and things, make use of these things. They are provided for the, for the benefit of the people, so it's not wrong to use these things. Because the body is given us, to us by the grace of Krishna, so we have to maintain the body. And Krishna has given, you could say Krishna has made the arrangement that medical science is there. 
So medical science is there for maintaining the body, to make it healthy, to, to keep it healthy, so that we can use the body in the service of Krishna. Hmm. So you go to the doctor, you get treatment, yeah. Take the medicine, yeah. And so with the help of doctor, then you can do more service for Krishna. We have to learn how to utilize everything properly. But we don't want to exploit the resources of the material nature. This the point. That's the point. We don't want to think the world is just there for our enjoyment. We can get go to we can go and get, get medical aid to make the body healthy so that we can use it for Krishna's service. We don't just make the body healthy so that you can have more sense enjoyment. So medical science is a gift of Krishna. All the medicine, all the herbs, the different medicines which are there. There you could say these are the gifts of Krishna. They are arranged for the complete maintenance of this world. All right. Uh, Arikshita Maharaj. Yes, yes Prabhu. Uh, Maharaj, let's say a devotee, uh, devotee, they know Krishna is a supreme lord, but they're also working very hard collecting the money. They say in the future, I will spend this money for the Krishna consciousness. Whether this is encouraged, can we say they're also in the complete knowledge, Maharaj? They're spending the money for Krishna conscious in Krishna consciousness? Yeah, they work very hard, okay, and uh, they say in the future, I will spend this money all for Krishna consciousness purpose. So that's why I'm working very hard. Okay, I don't know whether we can we can say uh, whether they also in the in the in the complete knowledge, Maharaj. Either this is encouraged, either we should not do as a devotee, we should not do that. Either we have to focus in the different way our life. But do you mean they work in a job, or are they just go and collect money from other people? No, they are working, Maharaj. Working, they are very working very hard. Sometimes cannot attend, you know the you know, the the temple programs. But they say, I will collect this money, I will spend for you no know, future, I will spend for the you no know, Krishna consciousness, like that. This kind of both they take. Okay, so can we say they in the complete knowledge as well? Well, <laughs> we have to see how the, how well they can do it. And, okay. You know, the, are they able to, how long are they able to maintain themselves in Krishna consciousness without association? Without mm. coming to the association of devotees, we we are, we do hear from Srila Prabhupada. He said that if you think you can be in Krishna consciousness without taking advantage of the association of the devotees, mm. then that's just illusion. That's just another illusion. All right. You know, you, you people may say, "No, I used it all for Krishna," but. How, how long will they do it all? Will they use it all for Krishna? And you know, what are they going to do for Krishna? They say they're going to be in Krishna consciousness in their on their own, just at the in at home with their own family. They don't want to associate with other people. It's not good. They should associate. They we need association. We need to hear. And it said that hearing about Krishna in the association of devotees is more ple gives pleasure to the ear and to the heart. But if you're just going to be in Krishna consciousness on your own, in your own home or whatever, then you how much Krishna consciousness will you have there? I'm I'm oh. doubtful how how people can maintain their Krishna consciousness. If they don't come, if they don't come and attend the programs, and it's not it's not like the programs are every day. If you you have a program once a week, and they can't even come once a week, it's not very good. So it does it doesn't speak very highly for people if they don't come and associate. 
we're very doubtful about how much they can be in Krishna consciousness. They do need to come and associate. Okay. Yeah. So completeness okay. that means that means connecting also with 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 the devotees. You want to have that completeness, that connection should be there with all with the with the society of devotees. Without association with the devotees, then how will we advance? How will we learn anything? We need to have that. <coughs> Some people say, oh, very difficult to associate with devotees. We don't get along with them and so on. No, that's a challenge. You can see that's a challenge of which Maya is giving you. That you, you don't like to associate, you don't like to be with people. So association is, is very important. We have right. to develop toler we have to develop tolerance and we have to accept, you know, that sometimes things will be difficult, sometimes we won't have the same point of view as other people who have different opinions about things. We have to put up with these differences and still work together to go on in Krishna consciousness. So these challenges often come to us. We have to expect there will be challenges, there will be difficulties. But we don't want to give up. We want to keep going, keep challenging, keep fighting. You know, put up with the difficulties and go on and gradually it becomes nectar. So people are saying they're going to spend, they're, they're working and spending the money for Krishna and Krishna consciousness. Okay, that's very nice. But they can come to, they should still come and be with the, in the association of devotees. They may not want to give any money. Okay, we don't say you have to give money. But you come, come and associate with the devotee. That's the important thing. Okay. Okay, Maharaj. Yeah. Thanks, Maharaj. Yes. I got a question. Uh, mm -hmm. Regarding the living entities, they are also considered complete, isn't it? Yes. So the complete. They're they're complete units. Yep. Yeah. They're complete. Uh, uh, in the sense that, uh, but then the uh, the potency and all that is. Uh, I mean, to compare to the Lord, you know, uh, I was just thinking, you know, it's, you know, how it can be like complete in one sense. Well, we're we're not complete like the Lord. You yeah. know, we 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 feel uh, as the prophet talks about that feeling of incompleteness. So we have that nature that's, you know, we that on our own without connection with the Lord, we're not really complete that we're actually incomplete without that connection to the Lord. And Pra Prabhupada was giving the example about the hand being disconnected from the body. So the same way the living entity being disconnected from the Lord, he is also incomplete. He's not complete. He's in an incomplete condition because it's only by connection to the Lord that you can actually understand his own nature, his own position. But so what, if that, one is uh, liberated, then one, one can actually understand that uh, concept. Of, is that what you meant? Liberate, once one is one liberated, is... well, once one is just, yeah, you could say Krish, once one... Krishna conscious, once one is Krishna conscious, then you can understand this. Liberation, you know, the impersonalists, they also want to get liberation. But actually, they're also incomplete because they, they have not understood fully their relationship with the Supreme. 
They have incomplete knowledge. But the devotees, they have complete knowledge. They are completely connected to the Lord. Thank you, Maharaj. And Prabh Prabhupada gives examples of so many different other systems by which people try to uh, try to feel happy or secure in the material world. He talks about, you know, some political party or international or interplanetary. They're all com incomplete unless they're connected with the Lord. And pra Prabhupada uses this word dovetailed. <laughs> dovetailed. I remember when we were, as a child at school, we were doing woodwork and we learned to make a, a dovetail joint. It's a, 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 it's a way when you cut the wood in such a way that two pieces of wood can be joined together. So, so dovetailing. So Prabhupada uses this word to describe the living entity's connection with the Supreme Lord. When two pieces of wood are dovetailed together, then it, it's very secure and they, it will hold nicely. And so the same way, when the living entity is dovetailed with the Lord, then he will actually be complete. Uh, you, you say living entities are also complete. Well, that's, that's the illusion to think we're complete. You could think, well, I don't need Krishna. I, I'm complete. I'm enjoying my life. I'm having my sense gratification. You know, and people may think, no, I don't need Krishna. Why do I need Krishna? I'm already complete. But actually, they're not complete. And at some point, time will come when they will become more aware of their incompleteness. You know, the troubles will come. The old age will come. The disease will come. The legal battles will come. And the, you, you will then recognize the incompleteness. And ultimately, we have to leave the world. So that will also be another time for feeling feeling bewildered because those who have no information about the Lord, then where are they going to go? The, where will they go? Into the oneness, into the oneness of the Brahman? That may be their goal to enter into that oneness, into the light and to give up their individuality. But actually they cannot. The living entity may enter into the Brahman he may enter into the impersonal light, but he still keeps his individuality because his individ he has a spiritual body, a spiritual body, which is not going to be affected. So going into the Brahman, that's not the goal. Going into becoming one with the Paramatma or getting Yoga Siddhi, yoga powers from the grace of those who worship the Paramatma, that's also not the goal. We want to understand the Lord fully, his Bhagavan feature. So, otherwise, it's, it's just incomplete. It's incomplete. We're wasting our time. Thank you, Maharaj. We want to enjoy life. We enjoy life fully when we're connected with the complete whole. Without being connected with the complete, we won't enjoy for long. That's for sure. But when we are connected to the Lord, then there is real enjoyment on the spiritual platform. Right? Okay, any other question on this mantra? Oh, the invocation? Yes? 
Ахари Кришна, Диагуру Махарадж, Пизаксет Майхамбала Дизнеса, Сулгуру Шишила Папапада, Агуру Дев. In the purport it is said that realization of impersonal Brahman or Paramatma is incomplete realization. But uh, how can one uh, consciously move from the level of Brahman to Paramatma and then to the personal concept of God? Uh, is it possible to meditate on all three levels? Or to move from meditation on Brahman to meditation on Paramatma, for example, uh, do we need to change our level of spiritual development? Yes, if you're just, if you're beginning your process of self-realization and you're simply focusing on the Brahman, then you may come to Brahman realization and you may come to realize you're not the body, right? You realize you're not the body, but at the same time, you may then go on to realize that there's also a paramatma. There's another soul, not just the one individual soul, but there's a, a, there are two souls. Mm -hmm. Just like we feel sometimes, you know, Sometimes you'll feel the, the Lord in the heart speaking to us, telling us to do things or telling us not to do things that he will tell you, you know, this is not good, that you shouldn't be doing this, you know. He'll tell you, oh, you have to wake up. It's early, in the, it's time in the morning. You have to chant your rounds. You have to get up. So the, the Lord is speaking. We can feel it. So a conscious person will be that someone is speaking, someone's there speaking, telling me to do these things and telling me not to do these things. So in this way, we come to realize that there's a super soul. And we understand then there's a super soul as well as the individual living entity. There's also the super soul in the heart. And so you can go on from the Brahman. Brahman realization means understanding you're not the body, that you're Brahman. You're, you, have, you have a spiritual nature. But then you go on to understand more that there's also Paramatma. And then you can go on from that Paramatma realization, understanding the Lord is there is Paramatma that there, there's also a Bhagavan personality. There's a Supreme Lord who is over everything. The Lord of Vaikuntha. And so you can go on from Paramatma, you could go on to Bhagavan realization to understand how the Lord is there in his eternal abode and how, how he sent us into this world to try to propagate, try to induce or try to awaken the public to Krishna consciousness. So yeah, you can go on, you can come, you can do, do like that, but that's, that's a long way, that's a laborious way to go from Brahman to Paramatma to Bhagavan you may never, many people, they just go to Brahman, they never go any further. They're satisfied just to understand I'm not the body, I'm Brahman. And that's as far as they go. But you get other people who will go on to become Paramatmavadis, and then some people will go on and realize uh, how the Lord is Bhagavan, full of all opulences. So it's arranged like that, that you can go, that's like going up in the lift. Uh, I'd rather if you walk up the stairs, if you walk up the stairs, the first level, you come to Brahman, then walk up more stairs, then come to Paramatma, keep going, walk up the stairs, then come to Bhagavan. So it can take a long time. It's a long way, a lot of trouble walking up all the stairs. But you can go in the lift. And you can take the lift and you can immediately start with Bhagavan realization. And with Bhagavan realization, understanding the Lord is Bhagavan, we will also hear about his other features, how he also exists as Brahman and as Paramatma. So that is for sure. 
that the mood of the mood of the devotees is to share their knowledge with other devotees, not to just keep the knowledge for themselves. Okay. Oh, thank you very much, Gurudev. It's clear now. Hari Bo. Hari Krishna. Okay. All Hare. right. Yes, All thank right. you so yes. much. Okay, any other question? Okay, then we'll go on to mantra one here. Let's read mantra one. Um, did maybe while well, we're here, does any anybody know how, how many classes are we supposed to have for this course? Anybody know? Hare Krishna Maharaj. Yes. Maharaj, 29th December is our exam. So before that, we have to complete. Oh, 29th December. Huh? Okay. Yes. Thank you, Maharaj. Okay. Okay. All right. So we'll go on to we'll go on to mantra one. Let's see. Actually, mantra one, two, and three make up a one group. They're dealing with one section, discussing about the proprietorship of the Lord. So the first three mantras are one section of this Ishopanishad. So we'll read this mantra one. You can repeat. Isavashyamidam sarvam. Isavashyamidam sarvam. Sarvam. Yadkincha jagatyam jagat. Yadkincha jagatyam jagat. Jena Magridaha kasha sridhanam. So both the invocation and mantra one, they are verses which you have to remember. They're memorization verses. So not very difficult, very easy ones. But you have to know them. You have to know them, and you should you should know the meaning as well, and you should know the me the key words also in the mantra. Right here in this mantra one, the key verse, the key word is isavashya. Isavashya. So isha, this of course we are studying here the Ishopanishad. So isha, meaning by the Lord. So Isha, this is the, the Isha Upanishad, the Upanishad, which brings us closer to the Lord. And then Avashyam controlled, Idam, this, Sarvam, all, Yatkincha, whatever, Jagatyam, within the universe, Jagat, all that is animate or inanimate, Tena by him, Chaktena set apart quota. Bonjata you should accept. Ma do not. Graha endeavor to gain. Kashyasrit of anyone else. Danam. The well. So translation, everything animate or inanimate that is within the universe is controlled and owned by the Lord. One should therefore accept only those things necessary for himself, which are set aside as his quota. And one should not accept other things, knowing well to whom they belong. So you can see the question of proprietorship is here. We sh and we are told how m what we should accept is that you should accept your quota. What is your quota? Right? One should accept only those things necessary for himself and should not accept 
other things, knowing well to whom they belong. So we're entitled to our quota, <laughs> right? The question of quota comes up. What is our quota? All right, so we'll read Prabhupada's purport here, very instructive. So everything animate and inanimate. So everything living and not living is controlled and owned. It's all the Lord's energy. So therefore, we should accept only those, what what is necessary, what we need, right? We should not be extravagant. Try to just take what we need. So Prabhupada's purport, he begins talking about how the Vedic knowledge is infallible. And he talks about the disciplic succession, how it comes down through the disciplic succession. And uh, Prabhupada uses the word aparushya, aparushya, which means that it's coming not from an ordinary person. Purusha means a person, but apurusha means not coming from just any person of the material world. So the Vedic words which are spoken by the Lord are called aparusha. And Prabhupada said this indicates that they are not delivered by any mundane person. An, an, if, if they were delivered by an ordinary person, then it would be purushaya. But this is apurushaya, so not from an ordinary person. And Prabhupada then comes back to what we learned in the previous, in the introductory lecture. Prabhupada quotes the four defects. The living entities in the material world, they have four defects. So this is why the knowledge which comes from an ordinary person is imperfect. But the knowledge which comes from the Lord, that is perfect. You see, this is the thinking of the uh, these jnanis. That's why they, they, they only want to accept Shruti. They say the Shruti is coming from the Lord. But the, the Smriti, they say this is coming from an ordinary person. So they they claim that it's not always perfect. But that's their claim. We don't accept that, of course. So Prabhupada said the four defects are there and ordinary people will have these defects. So they cannot give perfect knowledge. So the Vedas are not produced by an ordinary person. The Vedic knowledge, Tenhe Brahma Ridayadi Kavaye. The Vedic knowledge was imparted into the heart of Lord Brahma. Lord Brahma being the first person in the universe. And Brahma gave the knowledge to his sons and his disciples. And in this way, the Parampara was created. Parampara was begun from Krishna to Brahma and from Brahma to Narad. Narad is one of the sons of Brahma and Narad had many disciples and there were other, of course, there were other sons also who were also teaching, but particularly Narad. So in this way, the Parampara came about. And then Prabhupada talks about how the Lord is Purnam, right? We had in the in the invocation mantra, Om Purnam. So Purnam is complete. He's all perfect. There's he's not lacking in any way. And he he he's he, he's not also under the laws of material nature. 
because he's the controller of the material nature. Just like they have the, uh, you could say, just like the father. You know, maybe when we were young children, we'd go out and we'd come home late at night and father would get angry and say, you have to come home early at night. And so we may say to father, but father, you stay out late at night. So father will say, well, it's my house. I can do as I like. But you're here. You do what I tell you to do. So the same way, the Supreme Lord, he's the controller and he's independent and he can do as he likes. He's the controller of the material nature. We are not. We are controlled by the laws of nature. So Prabhupada mentions how both the living entities and in, inanimate objects are controlled by the material nature and ultimately by the Lord's potency. We're all controlled. All the living entities and also the inanimate objects like you know, what inanimate objects means uh, uh, houses, mountains, bri bricks, and stone. It's all, it's all the Lord's property. And it's controlled by him. Then Prabhupada meant Isha Upanishad is a part of Yajur Veda and consequently contains information concerning the proprietorship of all things existing within the universe. Who is the proprietor? This is the question. Because material life, we're very materialistic people. We like to think we are the proprietor. But you know, here Prabhupada is quoting the Lord is the proprietor of everything. And he refers to chapter 7. Just a minute. Sorry. Hare Krishna. Okay. Uh, all right. So then Prabhupada quotes about material nature, describing about material nature, referring to seventh chapter of Bhagavad Gita and how there are two divisions of the, there's the two sections of Prakriti. You have Para Prakriti and Apara Prakriti. There's a difference, right? First of all, Krishna describes the elements of the material nature, the eight elements, earth, water, fire, air, ether, mind, intelligence, and ego. And these elements are described to be the separated energy of the Lord. And then next verse says, but there is another energy also, which are all living entities who are struggling with the material nature. So there's two kinds of prakriti. There's the superior prakriti and the inferior prakriti. The living entities are considered the superior prakriti because they have consciousness. The other living entities don't have the other material nature, the element, the earth, the water, fire, air. There's no consciousness there. But the living entities, they have consciousness. So, therefore, they're considered the superior prakriti. But still, they have the problem because they're superior, they think the inferior prakriti is simply for their enjoyment. They don't understand that we are also the prakriti. We are also 
the energy of the Lord, and it's all meant to be used in his service. Uh, all right, so that the, as Prabhupada says here, there is nothing in the universe that does not belong to either the para or the apara prakriti. Therefore, everything is a property of the Lord. Uh. So then Prabhupada's purport goes on speaking about the Supreme Lord as the complete person. And because he is the complete person, he has also perfect intelligence and he can use this intelligence to arrange for everything in this material world as well, of course, also in the spiritual world. And Prabhupada gives some analogy here. He talks, he said, the Lord is compared to a fire. And everything organic and inorganic is compared to the heat and light of the fire. So the Lord is like the fire and the material nature, the living entities, they're compared to the potency of the fire, the heat and the light. So just as the fire has energy in the form of heat and light, the Lord displays his energy in different ways. Different ways, like the living entities, the different elements of the material creation. It's all part of the potencies of the Lord. So, Prabhupada continues, he thus remains the ultimate controller, sustainer, and dictator of everything. He is the possessor of all potencies, the knower of everything, and the benefactor of everyone. He's full of, in, he's full of inconceivable opulence, power, fame, beauty, knowledge, and renunciation. So we have to understand that, that there is such a thing as inconceivable potency. Inconceivable potency. Achintya Shakti. That it's a very important aspect in trying to appreciate the position of the Lord. We have to accept that there are such things as inconceivable potencies. For example, the sun is an example of inconceivable potency. That every day the sun lights up the sky and gives off so much heat and light. In the material world, in our, in our own experience, we may make a fire. We may build a fire and we have heat and light, but we can never have something like a like the sun, which for millions of years has been giving off heat and light without being exhausted. We build a fire and the fuel will be all exhausted. You have to get more fuel, keep putting more fuel on the fire. But the sun somehow it continues to distribute heat and light. So that's an example of inconceivable potency. And in the same way, the Lord also has inconceivable potencies. He has inconceivable opulencies, far greater than we can even begin to imagine. This is the position of the Lord. So we should be intelligent enough, Prabhupada says, to know that except for the Lord, no one is a proprietor of anything. Everything belongs to him. It's given to us by the grace of the Lord. 
And then Prabhupada talks that we should take what is our quota. And Prabhupada then gives some examples of quota. He talks about the cow, for instance. The, what is the quota for the cow? The cow does not drink milk, but she eats grass and straw. And her milk is designated as a food for human beings. I, I don't know how the vegan people would like this, but <laughs> and Prabhupada is explaining here about how the cow takes grass but provides milk. So this is the arrangement of the Supreme Lord. The milk is, as Prabhupada said, is designated as food for the human beings. Initially, of course, the cow will give milk to the calf, but as the cow, as the calf grows, then it doesn't need the milk anymore. And then at that point, that milk, the cow is still giving milk, and that milk is meant to be food for human beings. And Prabhupada said, this is the arrangement of the Lord. Uh, so we should be satisfied with what the Lord has arranged for us. He set aside for us these different things. And then he gives another example. He says, take for example, our dwelling, our dwelling home. They're made from stone and wood and steel, cement, so many things. So we must know that we cannot produce any of these materials ourselves. We can simply bring them together and make them into houses by our labor. A laborer cannot c claim to be the proprietor just because he has worked hard to produce it. Right? You may hire someone, you may hire a carpenter to produce something for you. So you can't think that just because somebody made it, it belongs to him. So in the same way, everything is being provided for us by the Lord. We should accept that he is the proprietor. <clears throat> And then Srila Prabhupada then begins to talk about the laborer and the capitalist. The quarrel between the laborer and the capitalist. The laborers meaning like in communist society, socialist society. And Prabhupada talks how people become like cats and dogs. They face each other ready to fight. Could be war at any moment. So Sri Ishopanishad points out who is actually the proprietor. In one place, the, the capitalists, they're claiming they're the proprietor. And in the socialist system, they're saying everything belongs to the country. But actually, <laughs> both are wrong. Everything belongs to the Supreme Lord. And if we don't recognize that, then we're no different from cats and dogs. Just a minute. Excuse me one minute.
Okay, Hare Krishna. I'm back. All right, so Prabhupada points out about the this conflict between the the capitalist and the communist, how they're fighting. The capitalist cannot stop the communists, and nor can the communists stop the capitalists. And they're all fighting for stolen bread. Right? The example was given about the thieves which rob some place and they have a lot of treasure and after they've stolen everything then the thieves said one of the thieves said to the other thieves let's divide everything honestly <laughs> right they are, they stole everything and they're talking about dividing everything honestly or fairly <laughs> so that's the mood in the material world people are fighting about stolen bread So we should understand who is actually the proprietor. And Prabhupada said, human beings are not meant to quarrel like cats and dogs. They, everyone is meant to be provided for. There's enough for everyone. In the, in the Upadesha Amrita, Prabhupada gives the example how a bag of rice may be there and the bird will come and take some rice, take a few grains of rice for itself and fly away. But the man will come, he'll take the whole bag. So we have that mentality in the human society. We want everything for our enjoyment. So we must be intelligent enough to understand what is actually meant for us. Just like Prabhupada said, the Vedas are meant for people, not for cats and dogs. Cats and dogs, they kill the animals. The cats and dogs can kill other animals for food and they don't get any karma, no sin. But if a man kills an animal for the, for the satisfaction of his tongue, then he gets karma. He's broken the laws of nature. So he must be punished, Prabhupada writes, because they've taken a life just simply for their own food. So that is not, that was not the law of proper mood. Everything was provided for food in the way of grains and vegetables and fruits. You didn't have to take the, the animal life. So what is the standard for human beings cannot be applied to animals. The tiger, Prabhupada gives the example, the tiger does not eat rice or, or wheat or drink cow's milk. But he has been given food in the shape of animal flesh. Although many animals, birds, some are vegetarian and some are carnivorous, but none of them transgress the laws of nature, which have been ordained by the will of the Lord. Animals, birds, reptiles and other lower forms of life strictly adhere to the laws of nature. Therefore, there is no question of sin for them. We, nor are the Vedic literature meant for them. Human life alone is a life of responsibility. So important to understand the responsibility of the human life. We enjoy the facilities of the human life and with facility comes 
responsibility. The animals don't have the same facilities. And so they, they don't have that responsibility. The animals are controlled by the laws of nature. But in human form of life, we are not controlled. We are given that independence. We, but we should control. But then Prabhupada says, don't think that simply becoming a vegetarian, you can avoid transgressing the laws of nature. Vegetables also have life. And while it is nature's law, one living entity is food for another. For human beings, we have to recognize that there is the Supreme Lord. Prabhupada said, we should not be proud of being a strict vegetarian. Animals do not have developed consciousness by which to develop, to which to recognize the Lord. But a human being is sufficiently intelligent to take lessons from Vedic literature and know how the laws of nature are working and derive profit out of such knowledge. So this is the responsibility of human life. Just like if you go to court, somehow if you get fine, if you get in trouble, you break a law somewhere and you go to court, if you tell the judge, I didn't know, the judge will say, well, it was your duty to find out and the judge will still punish you. It's unlikely he will let you off. You go, yeah, if you're found guilty of doing something, then there'll be a crime, there'll be a punishment, there'll be a fine. You have to pay. So similarly in material nature, we cannot say, I didn't know. I didn't know I couldn't kill. I didn't know he couldn't eat me. We have to find out about these things. All right. And then... Oh, Okay, so Prabhupada is talking, don't be proud of being a vegetarian. We have to know about the laws of nature. And he says, uh, if a man neglects the instructions of the Vedic literature, his life becomes very risky. A human being is therefore required to recognize the authority of the Lord and become his devotee. And then Prabhupada talks, what you have to do, offer everything to the Lord, and just take the remnants of food offered to the Lord. In other words, take prasadam. And then the Lord says that he will accept vegetarian food from the hands of a pure devotee. So we should not only become a strict vegetarian, but we must also become a devotee. And we must offer food to the Lord and partake, take the prasadam. That is the mercy of God. Only those who act in that way can properly discharge the human life. If we don't offer these things to the Lord, then it's sinful. And we are subject to the different types of distress which result from disobeying the laws. So the root of, Prabhupada continues here, final paragraph, the root of sin is deliberate disobedience to the laws of nature, disregarding the proprietorship of the Lord. Disobeying the laws of nature or the order of the Lord brings ruin to a human being. And then Prabhupada gives us a converse that on the other side, one who is sober, who knows the laws of nature, and who is not influenced by unnecessary attachment or aversion, is sure to be recognized by the Lord. And he can go back home, back to Godhead. All right. Are there any questions on this mantra here about proprietorship? Guru Maharaj, uh, sometimes uh, 
people say that everything belongs to the Lord, why we should offer uh, again as uh, to to take his prasadam? It's already everything belongs to the Lord. Yes, well, you have to show if everything belongs to the Lord, we have to offer it to him to eat. We have to understand he's a person and he can eat. And so we offer everything to him for his pleasure, for his enjoyment. It's not just, yeah, well, okay, it belongs to the Lord, so we will eat. But we have, the, we have to understand the Lord is a person. He's there and he can eat. And we offer our food to him. We offer not, it's not our food. We offer to him for his pleasure. And we will take the remnants of what he accepts. Yeah. So we yes, have to understand. Yeah. We have to understand the Lord as a person. Mm. And as a person, you know, he should be given food. And we don't just take the food ourselves. We're taking the food. We understand he's also, he also needs food. Of course, you could say he doesn't need our food. He has so many Lakshmi's, so many goddesses of fortune there in the spiritual world to serve him. But we need to cultivate the love and the devotion. That's why we need to offer to the Lord. Because by offering to the Lord, we're cultivating our devotion, our bhakti is being nourished. And if we simply take without offering to him, there's no bhakti, there's no devotion there. Yes, so you have to exp you have to explain to about them about the importance of bhakti. We have to cultivate devotion. Hmm? Yeah, yes, Guru Maharaj. Okay, any other questions there? Hare Krishna Maharaj, I have a question. Yes. Uh, Maharaj, my question is uh, regarding proprietorship, Maharaj. Uh, like what yes. Mataji said just now, everything eventually belongs to Krishna. Everything eventually comes from Krishna and eventually we have to like return back some sort of amount back to Krishna, you know, like whatever, whatever that is affordable to us. Sometimes, Maharaj, due to our false ego, we tend to claim that things belong to us. Though uh, we get it because of the mercy of Krishna. So times like this, Maharaj, how can we remind of ourselves that uh, ultimately everything belongs to Krishna? Well, we can remind ourselves that everything belongs to Krishna by using everything in Krishna's service. You know, just like you may be quite a renounced person, you may not have very much in the way of possessions. You Maybe you have some tilak and a mirror. Where, so you use your tilak mirror to put on your tilak. And somebody may come and, you know, take away your mirror. And you say, hey, hey, you know, just a minute. That's my mirror. I, use, I need that to put on my tilak every day. So, you know, we have to recognize that while everything is, uh, belongs to Krishna, he has given us some proprietorship over certain things so that we can use them in his service. Just like you may have a building, a temple, you may have a, a, a vehicle, a motor car, you may you, you, you use them in the service of Krishna. You have a home, you have a house. It's Krishna's house, but you're using it for Krishna's service. You know, you have to take care of it. We have to maintain it for Krishna. So, again, we have to we have to keep telling yourself, Krishna is the proprietor. Yes, we have to hear again and again. We have to hear these things, that Krishna is a proprietor. We have to be reminded everything belongs to him. Everything is for his pleasure. 
So how do how do we remember these things? By hearing, constantly hearing and reciting also. Just like we can recite the peace formula, Bhoktaram Yagna Tapasham Sarva Loka Maheshwaram. Sarva Loka Maheshwaram. He's the proprietor of all the planets. Everything belongs to him. So like that, we can remind ourselves. The more we hear and chant, we'll remember. No, Thank Krishna has given us Krishna has given us proprietor. He's given, he is the proprietor, but he's putting the certain things in our care. And he, he gives you things, you have to you have to take care of them. You have to use them. We should use them really in his service. He doesn't just give us things just for our sense gratification, but he's really giving us things which are meant to be used in his service. It's an opportunity for us to serve them. Yes? Yes, Maharaj. Uh, it answered my question. Thank you very much, Maharaj. Okay, and some more questions there? Yeah? Uh, Hare Krishna, Gurudev. Uh, how can we really understand what is our quarter? Yes, that is a difficult thing to do. To know what is our quota, we have to recognize what we actually need, what we need and what we don't need. Now, human nature is that, you know, our conditioned nature, we always want more and think we need more. You know, how much space do you need? How much space do you need to lay down at night? You know, you don't need a big space. How many clothes do you need? You know, do you, do you really need all these clothes which we have? Uh, it, it, it's so easy to accumulate things in this world sometimes. We accumulate much more than what we actually need. So we have to recognize what is really our quota and and try to try to minimize our quota, right? Not try to increase it. But try to minimize, try to reduce it. In other words, try to live a, a simple, a frugal life. Don't be extravagant, right? Extravagancy is wasting things, having more than what we actually need. So it's not good. I have that problem. I'm very extravagant sometimes. So try to control, try to try to be careful to use everything in a proper manner, in a as 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 it's as it's needed. Don't waste. You know, sometimes we have so many shoes. How many pairs of shoes can you wear? You can only wear one pair of shoes, and people have so many shoes, <laughs> so many clothes. So try, we try to want, we want to simplify, keep it big. At the same time, there are certain standards to live in the world, certain standards by which we have to live. You have to have certain clothes. You have to have clothes for different positions, different duties to be done. So like that, we understand quota. By being intelligent and examining and trying to keep uh, life simple. Yes. Okay. Thank you very much, Gurudev. Okay, any other question? Hare Krishna Maharaj. Uh-huh. One question is, what what do we mean by Bhagavad communism? This is a question of closed book question from this mantra one. So I'm not getting what it. Do, what's the word? What communism? Hard Bhagavad. Core. Bhagavad communism. Oh, Bhagavad, com yeah. Bhagavad communism. Yes. Bhagavad communism means that everything belongs to the Lord. Right? Commun a communist 
It's, they're saying everything belongs to the country. But Bhagwat communism is to understand everything belongs to the Lord. He is the proprietor. Right? It, sometimes we'll call it spiritual communism or Bhagavad communism or spiritual communism. That the Lord himself is the proprietor. We are not the proprietor. And the, 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 the government, the nation itself is not the proprietor. But the proprietor is the Supreme Lord. He is the real proprietor of everything. Thank you, Guru Maharaj. So when we speak about the Ishyavasha society, we mean that kind of society. A society with God in the center. We want to put the Lord in the center of everything, that it's all His. We like to put our own self in the center. We want to be in the center, but actually the Lord is meant to be in this. We're meant to worship Him and offer everything to Him. And I remember as a new devotee when I joined the Krishna Consciousness Movement, we would offer everything. Any new cloth that would first of all be put on the altar to the deities. Anything new, we offered it to the deities. We recognize the Lord as the proprietor. Prabhupada wanted us to do that. All right. Any other questions? Okay, so maybe we'll stop here tonight. Hare we'll Krishna, uh, yes. I have a question, but not related to what you was, uh, what you were teaching us just now. I just want to ask you: Is there any chance that uh, we can postpone the Monday class to Tuesday? Since Monday we have a few events like uh, the end of uh, Damodara and then Tulasi Vivaha and also uh, Bishma Pancha. Last day, we have some celebration in our centers. So, is it any possibilities that you can postpone the class to Tuesday? Well, it's okay with me. You have to ask everybody else. So, is it all right with everybody else? I'm all right with it. Yes. No problem, Maharaj. Can shift. Can. Okay. Good, good to postpone the Tuesday. Hmm. You also have a yeah. Everybody I'll has to. Yeah, everybody, please you. Okay, very good. So then we'll have class on Tuesday, Tuesday evening. Maybe Thank admin you. can admin can post. Thank you, Maharaj. Okay, Hare, so we'll meet on Tuesday. Thank you, Hare okay, Krishna. Thank Hare you very much. much. Thank you, Thank you, Maharaj. 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 Thank you, Maharaj.